Before we begin, let me just say that magic in the Witcher world is not generally explained in much detail. Gaps are found left, right and center, and Sapkowski was often mysterious about it, and CDPR did not mind to continue that tradition. For that reason, this entire series will be littered with theories in an effort to fill in those gaps, to try and make sense of the why and the how of its inner workings. But these are only my own theories, of course, and yours are just as valid. So if you do have one of your own, don't hesitate to let me know. Anyway, enjoy. Magic is chaos. It can represent nightmares, fear and unimaginable horrors, destructive powers, the forces of pure evil. They can destroy both the user and the world if used badly. It is a curse and will eventually be the world's undoing. Magic is art, capable of creating beautiful and extraordinary things, work worthy of admiration that betters the world around them. Magic is a blessing of beauty. Magic is science. In order to master it, your talent is not enough. Years of study are essential, as well as endurance and self-discipline. Magic is knowledge, the limits of which are constantly stretched by vigorous minds. Magic is progress, the reason we have the loom, the water mill, the smelting furnace, winch and pulley. Magic is progress and change. All three are right. Magic permeates the Witcher world. It's all around us, but what is it exactly? How does it work? Where does it come from? In this series of videos, I'm going to try to answer these questions for you, and that begins with the story of the first landing. In the early days of humanity, just after the first landing, a man named Jan Becker managed to subdue the power, as the first human to ever manage so. He couldn't quite do anything spectacular yet, of course, just minor things like forcing water out of stones, dispersing some clouds or stopping storms from destroying the crops, and the most basic forms of magic. But as humanity discovered this newfound power, they would seek ways to master it, as humans often do. So, not long after the landing, Becker, alongside a fellow mage called Giambattista, took the children of newly arriving settlers and started their search for sources. You might already know, Cyrilla of Sintra was a source. A source is a magically potent child, someone gifted in using the power. One of the first sources found was in fact Agnes of Glanville, who would go on to become the first ever sorceress. Eventually, Becker and Giambattista took any sources they found from their parents and brought them to Myrtha, the very first seat of mages. These were the first steps into the world of magic by mankind. Humans had existed in this world before, of course, but only now did they grasp the use of the Force. Though it had always been there, humanity hadn't realized its potency until now. However, humans existed in a different realm before. We know that. Why did they not use the Force there? We have to go further back for that and talk about the conjunction of spheres. Before the conjunction of spheres ever happened, the known world of the Witcher was inhabited not by humans, but by gnomes, dwarves, and eventually, elves. The elves were technically visitors as well, as they had only come to this world through magical travel themselves. However, as far as we know, they were the only ones capable of powerful magic at the time. Eventually, one faction of elves left that world once more, and one faction stayed. This separation would prove to be permanent, because some time later the conjunction of spheres took place. This event caused mayhem across every world. During the conjunction, several parallel universes collided. Imagine each realm in existence as large bubbles, and those bubbles crashing into each other. The creatures from one world would quite literally get knocked out of their bubble and into another world by the thousands. At the same time, more worlds were created in this process. Whether that happened because each world was torn apart or through magic, none can tell. But though more worlds opened up, at the same time, the doors to those worlds closed. Because it is important to note in all this that before the conjunction it was possible to travel from world to world quite easily at least easily for elves. 
It only required a little talent and skill. After the conjunction, only very few chosen individuals still had the power to travel from world to world. Chosen individuals. Like powerful and severn, elven sages, Cyrilla of Sintra, or the magical unicorns that now inhabit Tirnalia, the land of the NL. So it is quite clear that the conjunction of spheres did far more than to merely change the population of certain worlds. No, it affected magic as a whole throughout existence. Most notably, humans gained magic, and the elves in the Witcher world seemed to lose it to some extent. Let me explain that. Humans, as we know, had no business wielding magic before the conjunction of spheres, of course. But elves did. In fact, they were immensely powerful. One example of that power and the subsequent loss of it we find in the Aguara, fox demons. When Geralt meets this creature during the season of storms, she tells him this. Once we had great powers, illusions of magical islands, dragons dancing in the sky, visions of a mighty army approaching city walls. Once, long ago, now the world has changed, and our abilities have dwindled, and we have grown smaller. There is more vixen in us than Aguara, but still... Even the smallest, even the youngest she-fox is capable of deceiving your primitive human sense with an illusion. Curious. As you may know, Aguara did not spring into existence from thin air. In fact, they don't even reproduce normally. They abduct elven children. So while this is not necessarily confirmed directly in the books, Aguara were very likely elves at one point. Elves that chose to give up their beautiful elven forms, and in turn could keep their powerful magic. But even if we are unwilling to accept that Aguara were once elves, there is another lead to point towards the loss of magic and Severn. Among the Enshe, the only known elven sage left, is Ida Emian, an elf from the Blue Mountains, where they keep well away from humans whenever possible. When we look at the NL, however, we have quite a few. Outside of Avalach and at one point Oberon, we find a report in Tirnalia that states the following on dealing with the White Frost. The sages sent to handle the matter in the field have merely succeeded in delaying the advance of the White Frost, which slowly yet surely engulfs more and more territory. So, they sent a group of sages, not just one, to attempt to halt the White Frost so we can at least reasonably expect there to be quite a few en Severn among the NL. A strange discrepancy to be sure, not to mention that elven mages in general seem to be few and far between in the Witcher world. In large part because there are so few elves left, but for a race so magically potent from the very beginning, it doesn't make sense. Now, I have several theories on the cause of this problem, but the one I've settled on, at least with the information we have right now, is the closed door theory. When Yennefer was in the middle of teaching Ciri about her magical abilities, she told her about the basics as well, the properties of magic, the elements. To be precise, she tells her this. The earth which we tread, the fire which does not go out within it, the water from which all life is born and without which life is not possible, the air we breathe, it is enough to stretch out one's hand to master them, to subjugate them. Magic is everywhere. It is in the air, in water, in earth, and in fire. And it is behind the door which the conjunction of spheres has closed on us. For us. You know that, don't you? You have already felt the touch of that magic. The touch of the hand from behind that door. So, five true elements in total. Fire, air, water, earth, and whatever is behind the door. So, what is behind the door? In ancient Greece, and quite frankly, many other civilizations throughout the ages, the elements were already listed as such. The five basic elements, of which four were physical, the ones I just named, and the fifth would generally be named different things, from spirit, to ether, to simply the fifth element. We'll stick with spirit for now. In strength, spirit was always noted as the most powerful. In the pentagram, which often represented the five elements as well, spirit was the top center part of the star. Because unlike the physical elements, spirit had no equal 
and no rival. And this is mirrored in the Witcher world as well, where each plane of the elements opposes their opposites, Marides oppose Ifrits, and so on. And when we look at the Elder Blood abilities showcased by Ciri, where would they fit in the spectrum of elements? Spirit would be the most fitting by far. Time traveling, world traveling, prophesizing. So what does any of this mean? Well, Yennefer noted that the conjunction of spheres closed the door of spirit to the world. But to Ciri, it reached out its hand. The door is not completely closed, but the magic only seeps through, and only the most potent of sources have the ability to use its power. But what a strange concept that is, isn't it? A closed door. As we read in the books, magic is everywhere. Mages draw from veins or intersections of magic to cast their spells. That's how it's always been. The veins are always marked by an element, water veins, earth veins, and so on. To find such an intersection, one must simply focus on them. They're generally marked by things like dried up trees or gnarled plants. Most animals avoid them too, except for cats and dragons, who are somehow able to absorb the force. And certain places are very active in the power, such as the Temple of Melitile, which is exactly why it was built there in the first place. Having veins for the physical elements makes sense, Magic does seem to be a part of nature, almost. But having spirit veins? No, that's never brought up. Yennefer only ever speaks of the physical elements in terms of drawing on intersections, nothing else. But she does bring up this fifth source of magic to Ciri, so where does spirit magic come from? And why did the elves start to weaken in magical potency when the door to this source was shut? Why only the Enshe but not the NL? Now again, bear with me here, because as I said, not much about magic is explained throughout the books, so all we have is speculation, and we're about to theorize rather heavily. In the Witcher world, there are plenty of non-religious people who believe that the gods and goddesses of the world, such as Freya or Melitele, are merely a way for simpletons to explain the forces of nature, or in this case, magic. But religions themselves are not adverse to that explanation either, they simply believe that power is sentient, and certain personifications of the power are better than others. Neneke tells Geralt that to her, Melitele embodies order, law, goodness, and hope. But here's the catch. We know for a fact that, at the very least, one goddess exists. And it is very likely that Freya and Melitele are the same being, worshipped by different religions. So how do we know this? Well, we get two confirmations throughout the books. First of all, the Brizen Gammon. At one point in her quest to find Ciri, Yennefer requires a large diamond to power her megascope. Without access to one, she is forced to travel to the Temple of Freya to ask the priestesses there for a gem, called the Brizen Gammon. An enormous jewel stuck in the necklace of a statue of Freya. The gem is impossible to remove as it is simply a part of the statue. However, the priestesses agree to pray for Yennefer and Ciri in order to find a different solution or perhaps a way to help her. Yennefer, though not expecting much, stays in the temple with them, not joining their prayers, but falling asleep instead. In her dreams, she meets a woman who took on the appearance of the head priestess, but her eyes are glowing as if molten gold. After some conversation, which I will get into later, Yennefer awakens to find the Brizen Gammon at her feet. The woman with the golden eyes was Freya, and she had agreed to help the sorceress. Similarly, when Ciri enters the Tower of the Swallow, she has several visions, one of which is that of Ayola I and Mother Neneke, two priestesses of Melitele, kneeling before an altar. Their eyes staring, their faces twisted in a grimace of horror, Ciri wondered what they were seeing, past or future, truth or lie. Above them both, Ciri sees the outstretched hands of a woman with golden eyes, on her necklace a diamond shining like the morning star. The same image as Freya who appeared before Yennefer, and in both cases, matters of the mind were involved. Freya visited Yennefer in her dream and spoke to her, Melitela in a vision where she sent Iola and Neneke a look into the future. And in both cases, it seems this goddess can appear wherever she likes. For simplicity's sake, 
Let's call her Freya, as that is clearly the goddess she is based on. So, gods exist, and they most certainly possess great power. There is little doubt in my mind that they can travel beyond realms, beyond time as well. I believe that the source of spirit magic is Freya and her realm. So how does this work exactly, and why does it affect elves so much? We'll dig a little deeper to answer that question and take a look at the source of all magical energy in any form and sense. The elemental planes. The four elements from which mages draw their power, commonly called the natural forces, are of course air, water, fire and earth. Each element has its own dimension, which is called a plane. Unfortunately for us, these worlds are beyond our reach. They are instead inhabited by what are usually referred to as genies, each with their very own personality, usually a very spiteful one. And each plane has their own type as well. Jinns for air, Marides for water, Afrit for fire, and Dao for earth. Now, in the words of the venerable priest Krep, A genie like this, Mayor, is a living reservoir of magical energy. A sorcerer who has a genie at their beck and call can direct that energy in the form of spells. They don't have to draw the force from nature, the genie does it for them. The power of such an enchanter is enormous, close to omnipotence. And after a short interruption, he continues. The enchanter Stammelford, interrupted the priest, once more taking on the tone and poise of an academic lecturer, once moved a mountain because it obstructed the view from his tower. Nobody had managed to do the like before or since. Because Stamelford, so they say, had the services of a Tao, an earth genie. There are records of deeds accomplished by other magicians on a similar scale. Enormous waves and catastrophic rains are certainly the work of Marides. Fiery columns, fires and explosions, the works of Afrites. Whirlwinds, hurricanes, flights above the earth, muttered Geralt. Joffrey Monk. Exactly. I see you do know something after all. Krep glanced at him more kindly. Word has it, old monk had a way of forcing a djinn to serve him. There were rumors that he had more than one. He was said to keep them in bottles and make use of them when need arose. Three wishes from each genie, then it's free and escapes into its own dimension. So that's how genies work, supposedly. Endless reservoirs of their respective elemental energy, able to use it in mass quantities at will. In essence, that makes genies the rulers of their own realm. The elements come to life. Gods, if you will. Freya would simply be a genie from the spirit realm. A very powerful one at that. And not a spiteful one either. She's benevolent. She extends her hand to the mortals that crave her power. From wherever her realm may be. And magic as a whole, the intersections we find throughout the world specifically, are a part of genies' realms seeping through to ours. Important to note as well is that Freya, while with Yennefer, takes the sorceress to what I believe to be her own realm, the realm of spirit magic, as she bids Yennefer stretch out her hand and use that magic. You desired my jewel, Yennefer. I cannot give it to you without first making sure of a few things. I want to check what is deep inside you. Therefore, I have brought you here, to this place of power and might from time immemorial. Your priceless magic is apparently everywhere. Apparently it's sufficient to merely hold out one's hand. Are you afraid to hold it out? Now, obviously magic in this sense has always been a part of this world, because elves have been able to use it before humans ever set foot on these shores. The spirit realm, at a point before the conjunction of spheres, was open to all as well. As Yennefer notes, it was only closed afterwards. Somehow the conjunction sealed these intersections connected to the spirit realm and closed off that source and type of magic to those in the Witcher world. It tore the link asunder, so to speak. From that point on, the only way for a regular person to utilize the spirit side of magic would be through direct intervention of a genie of that realm. In this case, Freya. Perhaps not only her, of course, but as we see her directly intervene in human affairs, it's likely her most of the time. It's also noteworthy that priestesses are in fact capable of using a form of this spirit magic through prayer. 
and may just have no clue how they do it in the first place, which leads me to believe that this is again only guided by Freya directly, in Yennefer's words. But they're capable, when they want to, of using the power, at times just as well as we sorceresses. It's still a mystery how they do it, without any preparations, any learning, any studies, just prayer and meditation. Divination? Some kind of auto-hypnosis? That's what Desaia de Vries claims. They absorb energy unconsciously, in a trance, and they acquire the ability to transform it into something like our spells. They transform energy, treating it as a gift and favor of the Godhead. Faith gives them strength. Why have we sorceresses never succeeded with anything like that? And shortly after, she is visited by Freya herself. Sorceresses can't utilize this magic because they weren't given the option to by the spirit goddess herself. And this brings us to our next point, elves. As I said, their magic seems to have weakened in the Witcher world. So why is that? And what's going on with the NL? Well, let's talk about that next time. After having discovered magic as a source of great power, humanity quickly realized that it would have to be regulated properly. Some time passed since the first discovery, and during the Novigradian Union, Becker, Giambattista, and Monk, all three powerful mages, signed a pact with the rulers of those lands, the priests, and the druids. A pact of non-aggression that would separate the state and magic. But however well human mages were progressing in their art, what they truly needed were teachers. And so, in search of knowledge, Joffrey Monk set off to travel the Pontar River, known then as Avon the Pont Agvenelen, the River of Alabaster Bridges. He took with him a group of gifted children and visited the elven mages of Loch Muin. He pleaded with them for help, to teach the children everything they knew, and the elves agreed. However, only a few years would pass until the army of Marshal Ropenek from Tretagor carried out a massacre at Loch Muin and Esthemlet, killing every elf they could find sleeping in their bed, regardless of age or gender. This event began the war between the races, and of course as mages and elves had worked together until recently, no mages ever took part in this war. Marshal Raupenek then swiftly proved himself more deadly than all diseases combined. He attacked at night, murdering all the city's inhabitants. Most families died in their homes. The fires raged on for days. Magic, even human magic, has its roots in elven teachings. Spells are generally uttered in the elven speech, though sometimes in Latin too. The elven calendar is used to mark certain magically charged events, and as it is, elves attune to magic more easily than humans do. But magic, even though there's quite a bit to go around, and does have its limits. There is an end to it. In Yennefer's words, Lady Yennefer, how does it work with this drawing of the force? If I gather force into myself, then there might not be enough left down below. Is it right to do that? Mother Neneke taught us that we mustn't take anything just like that for the fun of it. Even the cherry has to be left on its tree for the birds so that it can simply fall. Yennefer put her arm around Ciri, kissed her gently on the hair at her temple. I wish, she muttered, others could hear what you said. Vilgefortz, Francesca, Terranova, those who believe they have exclusive right to the Force and can use it unreservedly. I wish they could listen to the little wise ugly one from Melitola's temple. Don't worry, Siri. It's a good thing you're thinking about it, but believe me, there is enough Force. It won't run out. It's as if you picked one single cherry from a huge orchard. So no, it won't run out. For now, but that orchard will eventually be plucked clean, or she wouldn't speak so sternly of the other mages. However, even if we pose that magic as such will never run out, magic in the Witcher world as a whole certainly diminished. When the spirit door closed, the option to draw on this power directly was subsequently removed as well. The elves of this world were no longer able to utilize its power. The power that still speaks to Ciri still speaks to the children of the Elder Blood. As, and this requires an entire video on its own, I suspect that the Elder Blood is nothing more but magic made manifest in a person's body, an endless power that cannot be extinguished. After all, 
Vilgefortz noted that Ciri had a powerful anti-magical and suppressive aura, innate to her as a person. Freya recognized that and reached out. Ciri would in essence be a part of her realm. It would explain why, when Ciri lost the ability to use magic otherwise in the desert, she could still use her Elder Blood abilities. She didn't need to draw from anything. She didn't need to wield it. She was it. Likewise, Freya still speaks to powerful sources, like those few truly able to see the future. Innocent souls, pure of heart. But Freya would choose who would be granted the sight and who would not, as the door to openly use spirit energy was now shut. And unfortunately, not all those gifted could handle the power at all. Many prophets and seeresses have gone completely mad. After the massacre at Loch Muin, it is unlikely that many elven mages were left to begin with. After all, Loch Muin seemed a meeting place for elven sorcerers, and considering the limit to elven repopulation in the first place, well, the lost mages were not so easily regained. In the books we only ever meet two, Ida Emian, the Ensevern, and Francesca Finderbear, or Enid Anglena. But even outside of that, the elves that were left seemed weaker than before. As said, where the NL boast quite a few elven sages, the Enshe only have a single one. But they were one people once, so how? Well, without the fifth element to strengthen spells in general, elven magic would have taken a hit regardless. Not just because less magic was available in the world, but also because each element is different. Taking the element of spirit away would almost certainly impact quite a few spells, and in general those specialized in the art as well. But more on that later. It didn't mean that elven mages were necessarily weaker than humans, but it did mean that a great deal of power was lost in the conjunction, and the Enshe were somewhat knocked down a few levels. But the NL retained their power. Before, I theorized that magic as we know it is strictly linked to the Witcher world that Geralt inhabits, and with that one can assume that each world has their own mysteries and perhaps their own source of magic. We never see ghouls, drowners or neckers cast spells. Vampires certainly don't need to draw upon the power in any way. They have their very own abilities to draw from. No, magic does not exist in every world, but it certainly shows in Tianalia, where the NL reside. A thing of note for the NL is that their time cycles seem to be the same as ours. They can only travel to other realms during magically active times of the year, such as the autumn equinox. And even then, they can't stray too far from the Ard Gaith, the gate of the world. However, they do seem to command powerful magic in their own realm. So where does their magic come from? Well, unicorns. When Ciri meets the unicorns a second time in Tiernalia, they tell her this. You cannot be imprisoned. You are now master of the worlds. Like hell, I don't have any natural talent. I can't control anything. And I relinquished the power in the desert a year ago. Little Horse was a witness. In the desert, you relinquished conjuring. The power you have in your blood cannot be relinquished. You still have it. We shall teach you how to use it. And isn't it, perhaps, she shouted, that you want to capture that power, this power over the worlds that I reputedly have? It is not. We do not have to capture that power, for we always had it. Trust them requested Ihuaraquax. Trust, Star Eye. So, the unicorns are all magically charged, as Ciri is. Before, I theorized that Ciri and her elder blood simply turned her entire body into a vessel for the power. The unicorns are such vessels just the same, and the NL learned to draw from them, learned to capture their essence and create through them the elder blood to keep their magic for themselves. But why do that? Well, Little Horse has more to say on that, when Ciri is confronted with a veritable mountain of human bones. The lightning flashed and Ciri screamed. She understood whose remains they were. The skull, which bore the marks of a blade, had canine teeth. Now you understand, she heard in her head. Now you know, they did it, the NL. The Elder King, the Fox, the Sparrow Hawk. This world was not their world at all. It became their world. After they had conquered it, 
when they opened Ard Gaith, having deceived and taken advantage of us, just as they have tried to deceive and take advantage of you. All along, the elves had been using unicorns to travel from world to world. It was not their power at all, it was the unicorns. Elves like to pretend that humans had destroyed their own realm before they were thrown into their current one during the conjunction of spheres. But it is far more likely that Tianalia was the original human realm. And once invaded by the horde of unicorns and the NL, they lost it. This would explain why humans first came into contact with magic after the conjunction. Magic did not appear in Tiernalia until the unicorns arrived. It's likely that the only reason the unicorns stay to fight is because they feel responsible for this massacre. Very likely, in fact, as they make a point of showing Ciri what had truly happened in this world before she leaves. And it is quite easy for Ihwaraquax, Ciri's unicorn friend, to leave that realm with her as well. In that same vein, the Enshe may have merely stayed in their current realm because magic was so readily available there. They wouldn't need unicorns to cast. They had the intersections of the power. Though, of course, this is all speculation. Regardless, the unicorns, given their Elder Blood abilities, were likely a source of spirit energy, which would directly explain the abundance of elven sages in Tianalia, as spirit magic is the most powerful kind. And now that we know how most mages acquire their power, it's time we have a look at how to use it. As I said, spells in the Witcher world are all uttered in the Elder Speech language, bar a few Latin names. Elder Speech being the elven tongue, of course. Alongside the actual words, most mages will then use hand gestures to activate the spell. However, it is important to note that, in general, gestures are enough to cast a spell as well, as long as the mage in question is powerful enough. In fact, even though the elves have certainly lost some of their magical prowess, they are still clearly more magically active than humans. As the elven way of casting is almost always wordless, they merely use a gesture. Which means the movement of one's hand is the most important part of spellcasting, and it's hardly as easy as it sounds. Oh gods! Yennefer sighed in resignation and, ruffling her black hair with both hands, lowered her head. But it's so simple if you can't master this move! What will happen with the harder ones? Ciri turned away, mumbled something in a raspy voice, and massaged her stiff hand. The magician sighed once more. Take another look at the etching. See how your fingers should be spread. Pay attention to the explanatory arrows and runes describing how the move should be performed. I've already looked at the drawing a thousand times! I understand the runes! Vort calma is velui, away from oneself, slowly, down, quickly, the hand like this, and the little finger. It's impossible to position it like that without bending the ring finger at the same time. Give me your hand. Ouch! Not so loud, Siri. Otherwise Neneka will come running again, thinking that I am skinning you alive or frying you in oil. Don't change the position of your fingers, and now perform the gesture. Turn, turn the wrist. Good. Good. Now shake the hand, relax the fingers, and repeat. No, no! Do you know what you did? If you were to cast a real spell like that, you'd be wearing your hand in splints for months! Are your hands made of wood? In time, mages get used to twisting their hands into unnatural positions, and it becomes easier. But even then, it's tricky. Magic is not random hand-waving. A wrong finger movement, a slightly offbeat thumb, and the spell fails. Though a wrong move can also involuntarily strengthen the spell. Your posture and breathing also influences the magic you're attempting to use. And on top of that, perhaps unsurprisingly, spellcasting hurts. Yennefer tells Ciri that in order to harden oneself to the pain of casting, you must practice without painkillers. And when one makes mistakes, the pain is far, far worse. While proper spells only cause very minor pain, a mistake can cause cramps, convulsions, violent spasms, and light headaches. So, to make things easier, some mages like to use items through which they cast their magic. For example, Triss Merigold often uses an amulet, sapphire set on a silver-thin chain, to cast spells as well. 
not in the least because she's allergic to magical potions. Geralt's mother, Vicenna, likewise, owed a great deal of her magical abilities to a Chalcedony she wore on her head at all times. Stregobor, Dorgarai, and the Druid Mousak have all been seen using wands. Sometimes even staffs are used. In fact, through the use of wands, certain non-magically gifted individuals are even capable of using some very basic magic, such as Estera Thyssen of Kovir, who uses a tiny enchanted magic wand to use his magical paintings. Which means that in order of difficulty, one would go from voiceless gesturing to gestures with a spoken spell to casting spells through objects and words. That doesn't necessarily mean that mages using objects are weaker in their spell casting, but it does mean that perhaps they have difficulties casting certain spells, or they're trying to strengthen their casts through the object. Matter of fact, some spells require objects to cast in the first place, but let's talk about that in the next episode, because that's quite a rabbit hole in and of itself. Until next time, va fail. While politics and magic were, at this point, separate entities, that didn't mean mages didn't interfere in the ruling of their new home. Humans, as they do, so love to quarrel, and it took the intervention of Ruffard the White to end a feud between the human kings of old and mark the end of six years of war. Raffard, of course, then declined to accept the crown himself. No, instead, he accepted the post of royal counsellor which, in essence, made him the true ruler of the lands, as in all honesty, the kings just weren't that bright. Soon after, the first chapter of wizards was formed, and the law of magic was introduced. The first chapter consisted of Herbert Stammelfort, Aurora Henson, Ivo Richard, Agnes of Glanville, Geoffrey Monk, and Radmir of Tor Carnet. Unfortunately, it didn't take long for war to break out in the magical community. Among them, not all wished to follow the law the chapter had set. They did not want to accept their new rulers, and those who refused to submit were thus wiped out. Mage against mage battled, and many fell in this brutal war. Among them, Raffard the White. Historical treaties won't utter a word on the business, wouldn't want to spoil a beautiful legend. Thankfully, things remained calm for a time after, and the elements themselves were mastered for the very first time. Air, mastered by Agnes of Glanville, water, Aurora Henson, earth, by Nina Fioravanti, and finally, fire, by Clara Larissa de Winter. We talked about the elemental planes before, and we will again in ascribing different elements to different spells. You see, Spells do in fact have elements of their own. Most of them are easy to ascertain, of course. A fireball will have strong links with the elements of fire, and although it is not necessary to draw upon a fire intersection, doing so will result in a more powerful spell of that kind. For this reason, most mages will focus on a single element in their spellcasting, and at the very least, try to match the vein to their spell. And mages generally aren't keen to share what elements they specialize in, as it makes them an easier target in possible battles. The chamber he was led to wasn't typical of the rooms where sorcerers usually received applicants. Usually, Geralt was well acquainted with the custom, mages gave audiences in large rooms with very formal, often severe and cheerless decor. It was practically unthinkable for a sorcerer to receive anybody in a private, personal room. A room able to provide information about the disposition, tastes, and predilections of a mage, particularly about the type and specific character of the magic they made. In choosing your desired element, it's important to know what each represents and what it can do. Water is the easiest element to master. Earth requires more power, air requires more skill, and fire is a dangerous element all on its own as it tends to lure the mage to destructive tendencies. A perfect example of a fire-specialized mage would be Vilgefortz, who was very likely the most powerful mage to have ever lived. The problem with fire is that it is naturally violent. When Ciri attempted to draw the power from fire while stuck in the desert with no food or water, she nearly succumbed to the flames. 
It tried to talk her into destroying everything and everyone she had ever loved, because eventually they would all betray her. Siri could only make the voices stop after renouncing her magical abilities altogether, giving up her power outside of her innate Elder Blood abilities. Let it burn, Falka! Let it all burn! Go away! Be gone! I don't want you! I don't want your power! Let it burn, Falka! Let it burn! I don't want to! You do! You desire this! Desire and lust seethe in you like a flame! Pleasure is enslaving you! It is might! It is force! It is power! The most delicious of the world's pleasures! Lightning, thunder, wind, the thudding hooves and neighing of unicorns, galloping with abandon around the fire. I don't want that power! I don't want it! I relinquish it! So, each element has different properties that affect magic differently, such as water, which is used for divination, for example. You couldn't necessarily use Earth as a conduit through which to see the future, Perhaps an extremely powerful mage could, but due to the nature of the element, it would be extraordinarily difficult to achieve, and in the end, quite a pointless endeavour, because you could just use water. Likewise, there are several spells that I would categorise under spirit-based magic that would prove especially cumbersome to cast. Among them, portals. Because portals are not actually as easy to cast as you might think, not to mention the fact they have limited range. For example, to reach Vilgefortz for a meeting at his castle, Tissai and Avris had to travel through three separate portals, and on top of that, they're not always safe. Sometimes people get ripped in half instead, or they just disappear entirely. I hate portals. If those around you are especially unlucky and the portal collapses in the process, it explodes with a bang and bursts the eardrums of everyone in range. Elder Blood Portaling, on the other hand, which I theorized was simply a powerful use of spirit magic, even when used by an unpracticed source, does not tend to result in any such disasters, not to mention their range does not seem to have a limit. However, not every type of magic seems to have an easily discernible type. Some people have innate magical abilities. Regular humans can activate magical items. And then there's curses, of course, blood magic, and necromancy. So where do those fit? Well, plainly, magical items are simply enchanted, of course. They already have an active spell attached to them and will only perform these very basic functions, such as Estherat Thyssen's golden wand, which he uses to hide his political maps. Sometimes entire dimensions simply consist of one gigantic woven spell. Think the magical fairyland in Toussaint, which was created solely by a spell cast by Artorius Vigo. I have Nahelenes going wild. Whole land's an illusion. It's so powerful there's no way to dispel it. But those spells eventually deteriorate, so Estherat would have had to buy new wands every so often, or hire a mage to keep the enchantments active. Likewise, a crystal ball, which you may think is a staple of magic, is a very easy to use communication device. A single crystal ball communicates only with a different ball that's attuned to it. Even the dwarves at the bank can use them, whereas a megascope, for example, fills much the same role, but much more elaborately. It is of course a lot more difficult to use for that reason. It requires a diamond with a rosette cut, and the bigger the diamond, the bigger the reach of the megascope, so you can contact people from further away. And no, that person does not need to be in possession of a megascope either. Although it needs to be said that once a megascope has been activated, it stays active for a while longer after use, seeing as Geralt and his Witcher buddies were able to use Yennefer's megascope quite easily, without proper spellcasting. Well, I'll do the talking. You two fiddle with the crystals. Kedmil blood hocus pocus abracadabra splatter. Innate magical abilities, on the other hand, are a curious thing. We posed before that much of the soothsayer abilities are likely linked to Freya in one way or another, but what about other types of abilities, like oniromancers or psionics? Well, there is another type of magic that we haven't quite discussed, and it's hard to give it a single name because it's described 
rather vaguely, but in essence, it would be an extension of spirit magic. Iola isn't a medium or a mentally ill soothsayer. That child enjoys the goddess's favor. Don't pull silly faces, if you please. As I said, your view on religion is known to me. It's never particularly bothered me, and no doubt it won't bother me in the future. I'm not a fanatic. You've a right to believe that we're governed by nature and the force hidden within her. You can think that the gods, including my Melitele, are merely a personification of this power, invented for simpletons, so they can understand it better, accept its existence. According to you, that power is blind, but for me, Geralt, faith allows you to expect what my goddess personifies from nature. Order, law, goodness, and hope. I know. If you know that, then why your reservations about the trance? What are you afraid of? That I'll make you bow your head to a statue and sing canticles? Geralt, we'll simply sit together for a while. You, me, and Iola. And see if the girl's talents will let her see into the vortex of power surrounding you. Maybe we'll discover something worth knowing, and maybe we won't discover anything. Maybe the power and fate surrounding you won't choose to reveal themselves to us. We'll remain hidden and incomprehensible. I don't know, but why shouldn't we try? So, yes, again, the goddess is involved. But more interesting in this case is talk of a vortex of power. We already know that, yes, Iola does in fact have the gift of future vision. When she touches Geralt's hand accidentally, she is thrown into a vision of his future death by accident. So this wouldn't be the first time she'd participate in a trance like this. And Nenica, as a person, is not stupid either. She wouldn't suggest it if it hadn't worked before. If each person is in fact surrounded by their own energy, in which the future is hidden, there is no reason why Oniromancers and Zionics couldn't simply take advantage of that. In the books, the only Zionic we meet is Kenna Selborne, or Joanna, and she is also described as an HPS, and that, even in the real world, is short for highly sensitive person. So a psionic is simply someone who is exceptionally sensitive to a person's mind, to the point of specialized mind reading, but no other forms of magic. An oniromancer would then be someone capable of reading a person's aura from afar, though only through their dreams. After all, dreams most certainly have magical aspects to them as well. And there are many species of harpies, and all are kleptomaniacs, though some steal dreams instead of trinkets. They especially like dreams laden with strong emotions, such as nightmares that recur every night. The victims lose their dreams, which can actually be a blessing where nightmares are concerned. And the harpies encase them in crystals, creating items that strongly radiate magic. Mages desire the dreams these creatures steal. They are even known to breed harpies on purchase with a view towards filching their booty at daybreak. Yet it is rare for a dream or nightmare to be powerful enough or to come from a powerful enough creature to satisfy the desires of a mage. As I said though, there are near to no facts given about this sort of magic, so all we can really do is speculate. In this case, the simplest explanation would be that dreams siphon their magical energy from the same aura soothsayers use, and oniromancers attune their minds to that energy. And finally, curses, blood magic, and necromancy. They all seem to fall in much the same boat, don't they? And they do, in a way. In more than one story, blood means power, and the Witcher world is no different. Blood magic is absolutely a thing, it just isn't used as long as it isn't necessary. As an example, the very first golem, Magical Servitors, was not created by a mage, but a simple dwarf from Maribor, named Bonaventura Sesto, a brickmaker. In Maribor at the time, non-humans were accused of bringing an epidemic to the city, though it was, of course, untrue. It was, in fact, a human's fault. But, as usual, at first, humans started robbing non-human shops, then arson and the occasional beating, until it escalated into a bloody pogrom. 
Humans went into the streets, murdering any and all elves and dwarves they could find during three days and three nights of slaughter as the guards looked on without care. They killed over 300 people, including the aforementioned dwarf's entire family. Driven mad with grief and thirsting for vengeance, the dwarf molded a ten-foot-tall humanoid out of clay and then carved the names of the slain non-humans onto it, along with a smattering of dwarven curses. Once finished, he slit his own throat, and when his blood splattered the gigantic statue, it came to life and started walking towards the city. His creation killed almost 500 humans, including the mayor and the entire city council, before a ballista was brought out to take it down. The conclave later found that Bonaventura had possessed hidden magical talent and through a torrent of powerful emotions at the time of his death, latent powers created the new spell. After some alterations, the creation of a golem now no longer requires one to sacrifice their own life, merely some ribbons with magical runes inscribed upon them. So, outside of the fact that, yes, dwarves can also be mages, it seems, blood magic seems to be linked to strong emotions as well. Like Sabrina's curse during her execution. In general, blood being the life force of any living being makes it a potent magical catalyst regardless. Though it is important to note that it doesn't generally matter what type of blood one uses. It's just another ingredient through which a spell is cast. It isn't a school of magic in and of itself, as proven by the fact that a golem can now also be created without it. So for now, at least, it seems that blood simply empowers a spell beyond its limit or makes it rather easier to cast for those less potent in magic otherwise. And even pig's blood will do for many spells, it'll just be less potent. And given that, when casting spells too intensely or too often, in a short time frame, one's blood vessels can burst, causing a bloody nose, it's very likely that a mage's own blood is also actively a part of any spell they cast. The power surges through their body, after all, before being released into a spell. It's not strange, for this reason, that certain blood makes for better catalysts, which makes certain races better suited for spellcasting. For example, while they exist, dwarven mages are not exactly common. Whereas elven mages, as we see in the NL and previously the large elven population of the Enshe before the massacre, are plentiful. Humans seem to fall somewhere in between, and of course there are a lot more humans out there that could potentially be a mage, due to their population rate, shall we say? And the widely spread elven blood does seem to aid in creating human mages. As was said, Yennefer, from her mother's side, had elven blood, and she is one of the youngest yet most powerful sorceresses currently alive. Not to mention that Vilgefortz seems to imply that, as Geralt's mother was a sorceress, that would make Geralt an ideal candidate for spellcasting as well. So, blood seems to be a catalyst, mainly, not a spell class necessarily. Curses and necromancy, then. What about those? Well, necromancy does not seem to need a curse, though walking corpses are often associated with curses. The only necromancy we ever witness ourselves, of course, is Yennefer's spell in Freya's garden. Doesn't look like the talkative type. Anyone can be made to talk, even a corpse. One must simply know how. Thought necromancy was strictly forbidden. So is premarital sex. But I'm not about to be bothered by such foolishness. In the books, it's only mentioned twice as well, and one of those times wasn't exactly in the best of ways. To think, snapped Yennefer. We have been forbidden from necromantic practices, out of respect for the dignity of death and mortal remains, on the grounds that they deserve reverence, peace and a ritual, and ceremonial burial. Because yes, necromancy is a forbidden art. That does not mean it isn't practiced. Of course it is. There are some mages in favor of allowing the art altogether, noting that one can also do some good by reviving corpses. Dead men can, after all, hide secrets which may save the living, and sending an army of reanimated corpses into battle was always going to be a better option over using living, breathing men and women who would, in the end, well, 
die in battle. Not to mention that corpses can be revived again and again until their bodies are well and truly chopped to pieces in such a manner that it's unusable. Unfortunately, their words fell on deaf ears, as it was decided that necromancy would always, no matter how good-intentioned one was, lead to evil in one way or another. And not in the least because none can truly predict what a revived body will do at all times, and losing control of an army of shambling zombies is not a situation anyone would want to find themselves in. What sort of magic necromancy would be is debatable, and it seems that different spells work for different people. Yennefer casts Selene Selene Defrain, Selene Selene Davidar to revive Skell, whereas Fisena only shouts Grealgan when she revives a corpse for interrogation. Though Visena was of course a druid first, not a sorceress generally. However, it may be simpler than we think. An excerpt from Of Sweat and Blood reads as follows. A veil hangs between the world men see, and the one they cannot. This veil blocks the dead from the view of the living, and the living from the view of the dead. Some mages can break through this veil and communicate with the dead, or else summon them to the world of the sun for short periods of time. This is the art known as necromancy. The dead can also break through the veil and enter the world of the living on their own. Yet unlike the necromancers, in doing so they are not driven by reason and will, but by a thoughtless, irrational need. This need arises from powerful emotions such as regret, longing or wrath. Very often these emotions gain their power by being invested in a material object by the dead individual, while he or she still knew life. The objects most frequently so endowed, wedding rings, favorite toys, or the instrument used for the crime which sent the returned individual to the other world in the first place. So yes, necromancy merely entails dragging a spirit from one plane of existence to the other. I say merely, but it requires a great deal of magical mastery still. And as it would seem, it's easier to reach a person's spirit if one's death was of the violent kind, as Avalach notes when he tries to use a magical lamp to contact Lara Doran. Day 3275. Final conclusions regarding the lamp. My experiences with the magic lamp unequivocally confirm that by using it, active centers of condensed spiritual energy can be coaxed into contact and can communicate a limited set of the being's last memories. Lara Doran's remains, however, emit entirely inert spiritual energy, despite the violent conditions of her death, which should have strengthened the desired tendency. And this leads us to talk of curses as well. While many curses are cast through intent and magical spells, such as Sabrina Glevesig's blood curse, many are entirely accidental. Because curses are very often cast through emotion, by very regular people with very regular hatred, sorrow, and pain. No curse is ever cast through happiness, I'm afraid. The Pesta in a tower full of mice, for example, who turned into this monstrosity through sorrow and pain. Or the young witcher boy whose life was cut short by the attack at Kaer Morhen and whose ghost now attracts wraiths to the training grounds. In the same vein, emotions can manifest themselves in the world of the living as monsters in and of themselves. Such as wraiths, who are in essence a manifestation of the deceased's sorrow in not completing their tasks in life at their time of death. They're demons, Deathmold. Draugrs are demons of war that arise on battlefields where the fighting was vicious and the slaughter particularly bloody. They are hatred and bloodlust in condensed form. Fortunately, not all curses require magic to break either. Often it's enough to destroy whatever object caused the curse to begin with, be that bones, a wedding ring, or an old teddy bear. Curses in and of themselves are so varied in shape and size that it's impossible to pin a single magical element to them, though it may very well draw upon the energy surrounding each living being, as we discussed before. One particular curse that was very elaborate indeed, and combined itself with blood magic as well, was Nivellen's curse. Which temple, Nivellen? 
pox only knows, but it must have been a bad one. There were skulls and bones on the altar, I remember, and a green fire was burning. It stank like nobody's business. But to the point, the lads overpowered the priestess and stripped her, and then said I had to become a man. Well, I became a man, stupid little snot that I was. And while I was achieving manhood, the priestess spat into my face and screamed something. What? That I was a monster in human skin. That I'd be a monster in a monster's skin. Something about love. Blood. I can't remember. She must have had the dagger. A little one. Hidden in her hair. She killed herself and then... Not long after the curse was uttered, using both magic, strong emotions and blood, Nivellen changed into a monster. Not only that... But he was magically linked to his house as well. The curse was eventually only lifted through the blood of the vampire he loved so dearly and who loved him back. There's a grain of truth in every fairy tale, said the witcher quietly. Love and blood, they both possess a mighty power. Wizards and learned men have been racking their brains over this for years, but they haven't arrived at anything except that... That what, Geralt? It has to be true love. One other time did we find a curse could be broken through true love, when Geralt attempted to break the curse of a werewolf. Quite honestly, all I can factually say about curses is that there are many kinds, and there doesn't seem to be much of a rule to any of them. Just that haunted houses seem to be the simplest of the bunch. A final thing I simply must talk about that has little to do with curses and hauntings, but something to do with necromancy, is Goetia. Goetia is a strange branch in and of itself. Forbidden, much like necromancy, but not quite for the same reasons. As you well know, demons do in fact exist in the Witcher world. Gondoro Dim and his minions were not the first. In fact, the Oxenford University has a department of supernatural phenomenons all of its own. Masters of magic visit and give lectures on demons and demonism and all the aspects surrounding them. Geralt would often sit in the back of such lectures and listen in. And so he learned that demons are beings from worlds other than our own. Elemental planes, dimensions, time spaces or whatever else you choose to call them. To meet such a demon, it suffices to summon them. Which means, in essence, violently pulling them out of their plane. Much like, yes, necromancy. And this can only be done through magic, of course. A magic called Goetia. Which mages are still reluctant to call magic at all. And Geralt himself had only dealt with two demons throughout his life before the events of Hearts of Stone. One that entered a wolf and one that possessed a man. The wolf had bitten to death and torn apart eleven people, and Geralt required the aid of a priest to eventually destroy the wolf. After which, the demon got loose in the form of a huge, shining orb, which proceeded to destroy quite a large area of the forest before simply fleeing, most likely to his own plane of existence. Not because it wasn't malevolent per se, no, Geralt assumed the demon was just bored. Curious, of course, that it would take the form of a shining orb, very much like a genie. The second, the possessed man, also known as an Energumen, Geralt simply killed. When a sorcerer summons a demon using spells, extracting the demon forcibly from its plane, it was always with the obvious intention of exploiting it for their own magical goals. Magus want to learn from demons. They want to know their secrets, steal their craft, they want to master demonic magic, which, of course, required invoking a demon, using it for all it had, then releasing it again. At least, in theory, that's what would happen. In practice, it often happens that the sorcerer or sorceress, instead of freeing the demon after using it, imprisons it magically in a body. Mages are known for their love to experiment, after all. And Geralt speculated that some mages, like Alzur, the mage responsible in large part for creating witchers, practiced Goetia because they enjoyed watching a demon wreak havoc in a man's skin. Watching the killing. And Geralt was likely right. 
as in fact one mage made it their life's work to find the perfect energumand to capture a demon in. Conclusion, as I suspected, the Witcher is a superb energumand, a demon trapped in such an excellently prepared body will become death incarnate, vengeful wrath made flesh, and placed at my command. No one has succeeded in creating a being of such power since the time of Malaspin and Alzur. This is a great day for science. Time to begin the incantations. As said, Goetia is a prohibited art because it's extremely dangerous. Unfortunately, the simple evocation of a demon doesn't demand great knowledge nor great magical abilities. It's enough to possess a necromantic grimoire, and there are plenty of them to be found on the black market. It is, however, difficult to control a demon once invoked without knowledge or skills. Many unpracticed would-be mages are torn to shreds moments after completing the summoning. And not to mention that it is a well-known fact that demons will never, ever reveal any secrets or arcana to you, no matter what. They will never let themselves be put to work. They let themselves be invoked and brought to our world for just one reason. To kill. Because they enjoy that. The mages know that, but they still allow them in. Which means Goetia is heavily monitored through magical systems, ensuring none can practice it. At least, most can't. This monitoring doesn't happen at Risberg, of course, because they invented the method of monitoring. Risberg's slogan isn't the end justifies the means for no reason. But enough about spells and curses. In the next episode, we should really get to talking about mages as a society. And that includes Risberg. Until then, va fail. It wasn't long until the very first Magic Academy for Women was opened. Their first headmaster, Clara Larissa the Winter, officially opened the Aratusa Academy. Many impressive sorceresses graduated at this equally impressive school, and magic would prove to be a rather feminine profession quickly after that due to the school's continued success. Mages like Ilona Loantil and Tessaia de Vries, great scholars in their own right. Unfortunately, not all was well in the world of magic still. Eventually, Falca's rebellion would set the world aflame, that of Magus as well. The sorcerer Radmir was flayed alive. The town of Mirth, the first seat of sorcerers, was burned to the ground. Falca's witch hunting would not be the last, not by a long shot. It's a well-known fact that Magus are distrusted by the common folk, for many reasons, not all of them unfounded. You see, some might say that the mages of the Witcher world are not entirely honest with the rest of society. The most glaring of these examples would be the Mandrake Elixir. It will take them some time nonetheless, so perhaps you'd care for a snifter of Mandrake. Mandrake, as you may already know, is an ingredient used in many an elixir or occasionally a poison. And while many of these elixirs and ointments are quite harmless, like the Glamour ointment, which makes one look impressively attractive for a time, another application is eternal youth. This is the very elixir which allows mages of all kinds to stop their aging process entirely and remain beautiful for all time. And before you ask, no, this elixir isn't dangerous or poisonous to ordinary people. In fact, anyone could use it. So why don't they? Well, in the far-off castle of Risberg, a testing facility is hosted, a research lab, if you will, where the most intelligent of mages try day in and day out to come up with new spells, new methods, new creatures that might help the world. This is also where the Mandrake Elixir was first discovered by a man named Ortolan. A man who, while he was still alive, was the oldest looking wizard in the world, ironically. As the Mandrake Elixir only halts aging, it cannot reverse it, and Ortolan was quite old when he discovered the recipe. Ortolan's only wish was to ever improve mankind's existence. He wanted everyone to taste the fruits of magic. He wanted everyone to be completely happy. So when he discovered the Mandrake Elixir, he expected humanity to begin their eternal lives in health and happiness from then on, of course. However, 
His colleagues didn't quite agree to sharing Ortolan's magnificent discovery. In fact, they went through great lengths to hide their methods from the world, all the while convincing poor Ortolan that humanity was in fact perfectly happy and healthy, and most of all, young. So yes, mages are, as a group, quite selfish. The fact that no one, not even the nicest of mages, have ever shared the secrets to this elixir with anyone certainly speaks volumes. At this same research center, they also sold amulets, decoctions, incense, perfume, enchanted tools, and even toys for children. Magic is, in general, a household application for those of reasonable wealth, you see? Someone has to fund all this nonsense, after all, and most else of the research at the castle was, in fact, nonsense. Many of them very dangerous, and not at all aiding in the happiness of mankind. Though not all, of course. Some were quite useful, like mutated gambeses, who feed on the larvae of malarial mosquitoes, but most creatures were simply bigger, meaner monsters. One such mutation, for example, had gotten loose and killed at the very least 20 people before Geralt chopped it up. And the mages responsible for creating this monstrosity were quite mad at Geralt's actions after the fact. Risberg, though it looked fine on the outside, was truthfully a collection of mad scientists, experimenting away at whatever their heart desired at the cost of other people's lives. It honestly seems that a mage's main activities throughout their life is to keep up a facade. Their society had about a million rules, not just those of the Conclave of Mages and the Council of Sorcerers, the governing bodies of sorcerer society. Oh no. Simple etiquette was not so simple in the magical community. One must never speak of their age, nor must you use honorifics, as they do not expect them from others. Don't mind-read another person without their consent, and certainly not during a banquet. And of course, do not make use of magic during high-class parties, although both previous rules were ignored by most mages whenever it suited them. Oh, and of course it's very important to pretend to like other wizards you meet. But this elegant mask falls away quite easily when a little alcohol comes into play. After the elaborate banquet at Thanet Isle, where mages gathered for a very fancy ball where everyone looked and acted equally fancy, night fell and drinks flowed freely. Those fancy tables were removed and replaced by sofas, chairs and stools. Mages sat around a huge barrel in the middle of the hall, drinking, chatting and occasionally bursting into raucous laughter. Appetizers and silver forks were tossed out, and they now shamelessly gnawed mutton ribs held in both hands. They played cards, slept in the open, hell even had sex in the open, but they would never show this side to the rest of the world. Oh no. To the rest of the world, they must be the sophisticated mages, with little time for trivial, regular human activities. And magic, magic should be theirs alone. It's unfortunately a well-known fact that mages despise other magic users. Because mages had to work hard to master the magical arts, to get to where they are today. While other children played, they sat on the cold floors of their stony tower, freezing their bones and joints during summer. And in the winter it cracked their tooth enamel as well. The dust from old scrolls and books made them cough and their eyes tear. Their backs were sometimes whipped if the teachers thought their progress wasn't fast enough. And this is why they don't like shaman, enchanters, healers, witches, and of course, witchers. It bothers them when they see magic, their art, used by others even when it's used badly. Because of course parlor tricks and witcher signs are nothing compared to actual spells. Signs can be cast with nothing but a small bit of concentration and a gesture, nothing more. This is why they are called signs. And this jealous guarding of the magical arts is also why they lie about more than just the mandrake elixir. They lie about blood magic, for example. As far as the world is concerned, you need the blood of a virgin maid to cast, quite frankly, any spell. Little do they know that pig blood suffices just as well. And you may think, after that barrage of negativity concerning mages, there would be a few positives, at least. But you'd be wrong, I'm afraid. 
Back in the early days of magic, Magus also used to hunt sources and magically gifted children. They would tear them from their parents or guardians by force or deceit to take them into the magical community, though that no longer happens as far as is known, thankfully. Before the chapter and council were dissolved, however, Magus the world over were still obligated to tell the chapter about any newly found source, and they would later attempt to coerce them to become a mage regardless. Small steps, I suppose. Though in all honesty, the magical schools were often used to pawn off unwanted children in noble families too. Not usually the men, as they were men, of course. They could always join the army and start a military career. They were valuable no matter what, even if they were very, very ugly and entirely incapable of finding a marriage candidate. Women, however, were not so lucky. If a girl wasn't desirable enough to find a good husband, and thus provide some form of gain for her parents, the said parents would often cross their fingers that the girl was at least magically gifted. That way, they could ship her off to Aratuza, and they'd be rid of her. An entirely useless child otherwise. This child would cease to be a part of her family, and instead join the Brotherhood of Sorcerers as their new family. That wasn't as completely heartless and awful as it might seem, because quite frankly, it would be the girl's best shot at a decent life at least. Because even if you went to one of the wizarding schools, Atatuza for the girls or Ban Ard for the boys, and you failed miserably at the magical arts, you would still be able to choose a reasonably profitable career. Because despite the rather difficult entry exams required at each school, to filter out the completely hopeless cases, some still slipped through the cracks and received some schooling. Generally, those that truly didn't care to work hard enough to become a mage were the sons and daughters of wealthy people, and one couldn't just throw them out without difficulty. So instead, the boys would often join the diplomatic service, the army, navy or police, while the stupidest individuals were sent to participate in politics. On occasion, the Kedwenian Secret Service would also be waiting outside the school to recruit newly expelled students. Female magical rejects proved more difficult to place, of course. They had attended a magical school and tasted magic to some degree, and they couldn't rightly be left around to wander the world without guidance. And so, they mostly became lawyers. So, mages were well taken care of, no matter what, really. And as a bonus, of course, any girl who joined the school and passed the first years of training would benefit from magic in a whole other way. Their legs would be straightened and evened out, badly knit bones would be repaired, hair lips patched, scars removed, birthmarks and pock scars erased. The young sorceress would become attractive because the prestige of her profession demanded it. Unfortunately, most sorceresses, though not all, also lose the ability to give birth during these rigorous changes to their body. And those that weren't were eventually forcefully sterilized in an attempt to stop mages from procreating. Apparently the child of two mages didn't always turn out entirely fine. That said, once out of school, a sorcerer or sorceress would begin their new life of magic. After graduating, one was always given a choice. You could stay as an assistant teacher, seek out independent masters to take them on as permanent interns, or choose the way of the Dwim Viandra. The latter meant roaming the land, taking jobs here and there with different masters, and after a few years, they would return to take an examination to earn the title of master. And if one would choose this path, the magical community even arranged funds for the wanderer so they wouldn't starve. As their own master, a mage could now begin earning money themselves, and usually this would mean investing in one company or another. Often banks or jewelers, but certainly not limited to these branches, because a mage does need to earn a living, of course. And just like any other profession, spells are taxed. In fact, King Heribert of Redania once placed a rather high tax on spells at one point, causing the Council of Wizards to boycott the capital and several other towns. To build their initial fortune, mages can do all sorts of things, of course. Many a mage will lend themselves to a town permanently and take up residence there whilst being paid by the town's council or mayor. In fact, one man Geralt had the displeasure of dealing with was willing to pay the witcher a hundred silver pieces just to leave their town's magician alone, because this was the cheaper option. So you can imagine the resident spellcaster wasn't exactly dying of poverty. 
sorceresses could also make an absolute fortune in removing unwanted pregnancies from noble-born ladies. This was something Yennefer did on occasion, for example, and because they were not just paid for their work, but also their silence, as men did not approve of this practice at all, it was a lucrative branch indeed. About as lucrative as curing infertility. On others, of course. Magus could not be cured so easily, unfortunately. But these practices in particular were so extremely well paid in part because not many mages wish to specialize in healing magic to begin with. So those that did always found work quite easily. In general, the non-magical community was quite alright with mages taking part in the day-to-day -day of society. In fact, in Loxia, Garstang, the people make a living in large part due to Aratusa being a part of their little town. Mages are quite literally the reason they're able to put food on the table every day, although this does seem to be the only reason they treat sorcerers with respect in the first place. Because the moment things went to hell, everyone turned against the mages. The moment they no longer served their purpose, mages were prosecuted. Because things did go to hell, of course. After the elaborate ball at Atatuza, a fight between two factions of mages broke out. One side, loyal to their northern monarchs, the other supporting Nilfgaard instead. Spells flew all over the place and, in the end, it left many a magician dead and Atatuza in shambles. The council and conclave that used to govern the magical community was completely destroyed and mages the world over now casually ignored their previous rulings. And though Atatuza was still active as a school after the fighting was over, sorcerers were no longer trusted as they once were. Many of the mages, previously sitting on royal councils, were kindly asked to leave. And so, a small group of influential sorceresses decided to create their own organization, known as the Lodge of Sorceresses. It was a group of all women, consisting of mages from every corner of the known world. Led by Philippa Eilhart, it also included Triss Marigold, Kira Metz, Margarita Loantil, Sabrina Glevesig, Francesca Finderbear, Ida Emian, Asirava Anahit, and Fringila Vigo. An unwilling Yennefer was also asked to join by Francesca, and Philippa meant for Cyrilla of Sintra to become a member eventually. The latter two never wished to be a part of any of this, however, which put something of a wrench in the wheels of the Lodge, as their main goal was to put Ciri on the throne of Kovir and through her rule the world in the name of magic for the greater good. You can likely tell that's quite the lofty goal that didn't quite come to fruition. Though the Lodge achieved a few things of note, mainly influencing the peace talks of Sintra, their organization was dismantled when their plot was discovered at Loch Muin, where they had attempted to re-establish the council and conclave. And after the events in Loch Muin, mages were officially open season. They were dragged from their houses and thrown into the fires, their possessions seized, their hands cut off, to stop their spellcasting. Many discriminatory laws used for non-humans were now also applied to mages. No one was safe. Not herbalists, not pellers, no one. While you were fighting Saskia, the city was staged to a bloody spectacle. The players? There were many. At first it was a hunt for the traitors, but it soon turned into a hunt for all mages. And there were a few skirmishes between Kedweni, Redanian, and Temerian troops. Rape, pillage, and murder. Not necessarily in that order. The pastimes of the Order's pious knights. And though it may seem that perhaps it's justified, after all, they seem quite selfish and callous. As with everything in this world, things are never so black and white. While it's true that the higher-ups in mage society deem themselves untouchable, and above the law, not all share that view. Some truly work to improve the fate of mankind. Many useful inventions were only ever made possible through magic. For example, Magus invented the technology for steel mills and smelters. And yes, while many of these discoveries are driven purely by profit, that doesn't make them any less useful. Without Magus, society as a whole would have their progress slowed to a crawl. Nilfgaard accepts mages as a necessity for this reason. While mages are not treated with much of any respect in the South, they are paid well, and most of all, they're not regularly burned to a crisp. Assuming they don't betray the Empire, of course. Evan Gesein. Asire Varanahid. Me vold hocht en gehedvin. Me vertruv het en bellengrik. 
visiden ip kizret, net en verb tene, het en kriza. Regardless, mages as a society are constantly threatened. Perhaps it's true that, eventually, just like witchers, they will no longer be needed. If they are to keep their place in life, they'll need to create new spells, new uses for themselves, lest they become obsolete, outpaced by technology. Regardless, magic will always hold some mystery to it, even when it's long left this world. <laughs>